Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at Plasticity 24.2. We're going to talk about some of the new tools that are released and how to use them. And if you have any questions on this, please leave a comment. If you want a, a full list of what's changed, you can go to the description of this video and I'll put everything down there. But let's go ahead and get started talking about the first tool, which is Deform. Uh, also remember, if you are looking to purchase Plasticity, you can use the code LEAD10 at checkout. That'll save you 10% and help out the channel. So the first thing that we want to do is take a look at how Deform works. So first, we need to find the Deform tool. And then the first selection it wants is something called a neutral plane. I'm going to select this face right here, and then I'm going to select the target face. Now, the first thing that happens is you'll notice that the text is kind of off here to the side. You may need to mirror it and it's just not in the right position. This can be kind of frustrating if you're trying to figure out how a tool works. And let's go ahead and talk about why this happens. So first, I'm gonna hit Escape. And the thing that we need to understand is that the neutral plane, its size, orientation, and location has a direct impact on the way this tool works. So first, I'm gonna move this up, and I'm also gonna move it forward so that it's right behind the text. And I'm going to move it to the side a little bit, try to make it centered. So the size of this face relative to the objects we're deforming, in this case, I'm using text, but it could be solids, sheets, or even curves. And relative to the size of the face where we're going to all have a big impact on the way this tool works. So I'm going to select all the, the solid text again. We're going to go to deform. Now we're going to select this as our neutral face. And here, and you can see that it puts it a bit more where we would expect. You may still need to play with the offsets and you can move the text around. But overall, that's what we would expect to happen. We can see it's deforming the text where we want it to go. You also want to use keep tools if you want to keep the original text. I'm going to hit escape. I'm going to hide this. And I want to talk about another tool. And that's called unwrap face. Now, unwrap face allows us to take the face where we're trying to deform to and we can create what's called a proportional sheet or a proportional surface. We can now use that as our neutral plane. So what I'm gonna do is move that. Again, we wanna make sure that it's in the right spot relative to our object. And I put it just under the text. And I'm gonna move it, let's move it to this way. All right, now let's try this again. So I'm gonna grab all the solid text, go to deform, select that as my reference. This is where I wanna to go to. And based on the orientation and the size of that neutral plane, we can now see that the text is in this orientation. We can, of course, move it around if we want to. But based on the size of this, the text is an appropriate size. Now, if instead I take this and I scale it down, make it really small, and I grab everything again, same process, use that as my input, now you can see that the text is huge. And this because what it's doing is it's looking at the size of the face where you're deforming to, the target, the size of the neutral plane that you selected, and the object that we're deforming. So you just have to remember that the inputs are going to be very important in this process. Let's go ahead and take a look at this with text. So I'm going to go ahead and hide all of these, and I'm going to bring back the curves that were used to create that. Uh, same thing, I want to make sure that they are in a good location relative to what's going to be my neutral plane. And I'm going to scale this back up and maybe move it back a little bit. So I'm going to grab all the text, hit escape to get off the extrude tool, and then go to my deform tool. Again, we want to get the neutral plane and this, and you can see now the text is displayed. We can move it around. We can play with the scale here if we want to scale it up or down. You can play around with these values. And again, you can keep the tools if you want to keep the original text. But at the end of the day, it is once again important to remember that the size of the face that we're going to, the size of our neutral plane reference, as well as its orientation and its position relative to the thing we're deforming are all big aspects of how well this tool works. So if you're going to play around with it, just remember you need to include uh, information about those sizes, the orientations, and where everything is located in space. Next, I want to take a look at an update to the measure tool. Now, this is actually quite a big update, even though it seems kind of minimal. Now, the measure tool has been around for a little bit, 
and it allows us to create an on-screen measurement between two things. So if I wanted to move the cylinder, let's say to a 50 millimeter position, in the past, what I would have to do is manually come over here and say minus 25 millimeters, and I could get it perfectly to 50. But in version 24.2, the new update allows us to use the measure tool to drive those dimensions. The trick here is that we need to select all of the geometry that needs to move, that top face and the side. And then when we invoke the move tool, we'll now see there's an underline under the measurement. This means that I can click on it and I can drive it to a specific value. So now the measurement's still on screen, but we can use it to toggle and change that value to something that we want. So that's a big update, and I've gotten a lot of questions on how measurement works and how dimensions work in plasticity, and I think that this is going to be pretty well received. Let's take a look at an update to the array tools. Now this works with both our linear and the radial arrays, and in the past, if we wanted to create a pattern of this hole, we'd have to create a solid version of it, pattern the solid, and then Boolean it all together. Now what we can do is we can select the face, we can go to array, in this case we're going to do rectangular array, and we can create an array of that essentially feature, so creating a hole through the part. One thing to keep in mind is if we select a solid body, you can see the radial and rectangular arrays are listed here, but if we select this face like we would normally do by selecting the object and then that face, those tools are not displayed down here. Uh, so you will need to be careful and play around with those selections, but you generally, at this point in time for the first release of this, you'll want to select those faces and then search for the array tool using F on the keyboard. So that's a nice update for both the rectangular as well as the radial array to be able to use those faces. The next thing that we want to talk about is updates to rebuild curve and rebuild faces or surfaces. So the curve tool is something that's available in the indie version, and we've had rebuild curve for quite a while, but we've had refit and number of points. In 24.2, we now have what's called explicit control. This is something that uh, Nick and his team developed, so it is in the indie version, but you can increase or decrease these degrees and the spans to get better control over how you're rebuilding those curves. The tool for rebuilding a face, however, is not available in the indie version. That's only available for the studio version. So if I'm going to search for this and I'm going to type in rebuild and select rebuild face, we can see here now that we've got explicit control and I can increase or decrease the degree as well as the spans to get a better fit of our final surface. Note that there are also some other options for things like extending. And you can see that this, uh, essentially the cage around it is being extended. And that's going to be the untrimmed surface version of that face. And that'll also allow us to control these points. So for example, if I were to grab these points, I could move them up and down and I can reconfigure that. Now remember that this functionality is baked into the raise degree tool. So if I were to select that face, and looked at raise degree. Uh, essentially what we're doing is we're increasing and toggling those points. We can also turn that off by using the toggle points command. Uh, that just lets us put it on and off. You can toggle those points on and off. And you can see here that we are able to change those surfaces. So that's a pretty cool update. Again, rebuilding a face or a surface, that's only available in the studio version, but the curve is available in Indie. So now let's take a look at one of the next updates, and that's the XNURBS tool called Square. What I'm going to do for this is I've got a couple of curves that I want to take a look at, and we want to talk about how this tool works. So if I was trying to build this complex shape in, uh, in 3D here, uh, I could use the XNURBS tool, and this would allow me to build a shape between these, and we can kind of get an idea of what that looks like. Notice that our options in here are continuity, we can try to do quad sided. We've got a flatness option. And then we've got some options for boundary and quality and our tolerance. Now I'm going to turn off the quad sided one. I'm going to right click and I'm going to move that surface up just to keep it so we can see it. The new tool that we have is called Square. And this is something that Nick worked with the XNERBS folks to create, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge. And I'm going to start to type in Square. And we can see here that we get essentially a very similar looking surface. However, the difference here is that we've got direct control 
over the degree and spans. And we've also got this match CVs option as well as weight if we're driving tangency on edges. So what we wanna think about with this is if we take a look, we've got these curvature combs displayed in red. These curvature combs indicate that the degree and span isn't high enough to match our input curves. So we may need to play around with the degrees and spans until we're able to get that input to match. The other thing that we could do is we can just leave those unmatching and use these as general guidelines for our inputs. If we want to say have a degree two or three surface, we can just see how far off we are from those original curves. One cool thing that we can do with this tool also is we can use it as a sweep tool. So if we start to type in square, we've got two inputs. It's going with this profile and this path. Again, we have direct control of using the degrees and spans. We can also use it with three sides, leaving it open. And again, it's gonna work the same. We can use it as a loft tool and have it go from one curve to another. So there's a lot of functionality built into this. But again, the big thing here is that we've got direct input over the degree of the surface or the curves that are used for their inputs. And we also have the ability to get an on-screen diagnostic using these curvature combs to see how far off we are with those original curves. Now, remember that we do have the option here to rebuild our curves with that explicit option. So with explicit control, let's say that we want this to be degree four and one span. We can do the same thing over here. We'll go explicit control degree four. And now if we go between these with our square tool, we know that we're using a degree four curve on both of those. And we've got one span in each direction. We can see how far off we are with those inputs and whether or not we can match that. If we click match CVs, it's gonna take a look at the CVs of those original curves that we just rebuilt, and it'll drive the rest of that shape using those CVs. This can get you into trouble if the CVs don't match from one side to the other, but in this case, we rebuilt both curves and we were able to match them. I'm gonna hit escape, and I'm gonna to add to my input here and use it one more time. So here, I'm gonna make sure that we're matching the CVs, again, using those inputs to drive the shape of that surface. So at the end of the day, what this allows us to do is have a bit more control over these surfaces. I'm going to select this and I'm going to toggle the points. And we can see the final surfaces in both cases look pretty good, but we definitely had more control over what happened with that square tool. Now, again, it doesn't need to be a complete square, but it is really looking at four-sided patches where the XNURBS tool has a little bit more flexibility with what those input curves look like. Now, this isn't the end of the updates. There is one more thing that I want to talk about. For that, I need to open up a new file. So the next thing that we want to talk about is something called Mesh Snap. I've gotten a lot of questions because on this channel, we cover 3D scanning and reverse engineering of uh, off of mesh-based scans. And Plasticity just didn't have the ability to do anything with that until now. So with version 24.2, we can now snap to a mesh with both our curves and our surfaces. So let's take a look at how this works. First, I'm gonna to go to a front view, but then I'm gonna get out of the front view. I'm gonna use my spline tool and notice that it's showing face and vertex as I hover over here. Now, because the mesh has a lot of vertices, you may find that you're snapping to a vertex quite often, but basically what we have here is the ability to draw our curves directly on the mesh. I'm gonna repeat that. I'm gonna do another one up here. Just kind of draw a curve. This is not perfect, I know, but if we rotate this around, we can see that those curves snapped to the surface. Uh, so that's big, that definitely helps us out. And the other thing that we can do is if we type in F to find and look for constrained surface, this allows us to start building a surface directly on the mesh. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna click a couple times and we're gonna work our way around building the surface. And it's gonna kind of work it back. The number of clicks you do kind of depends on the control that you need. And there are some options here when we talk about performance versus smoothness. But afterwards, we can see that the surface here, uh, it goes above and below our mesh input. So if you need to build out a surface that doesn't have a whole lot of complexity in it, you can use that constrained surface option snapping to your mesh. Now I'm gonna delete that and we're gonna do this one more time so we can kind of see the limit of this. So this time I'm gonna build it here. 
I'm going to start to come down. I'm going to work my way back and forth over the lip of this fender. And we're going to go to change its material. So it's maybe a little bit easier to see. We'll go to render mode. So you can see that we were able to build a surface directly off of the scan mesh. You can see that it does conform. It comes a little bit above and a little bit of below, but that's what we would expect to see when we're trying to do this. Now, whether or not this is a good quality surface is, you know, it's kind of remains to be seen. I probably wouldn't do this kind of reverse engineering of a scan with a complex part like a car fender, but it certainly could be helpful if you've got more prismatic bodies that you need to recreate, something that maybe was a 3D model that was converted to a mesh. I think the constrained surface could be a great way to reverse engineer that. And of course, we do have the ability to snap our curves uh, directly onto the mesh, which can be, uh, can be huge if you're trying to create something that fits to a mesh. So those are going to be most of the major updates, the new commands or subcommands that have changed, things like move now supporting the measurement tool or radial and rectangular array supporting surfaces or faces. But in general, I think that the version 24.2 represents a big step forward with some of these new tools. And if you have any questions on those or anything else, please leave a comment. And remember that if you are purchasing, we are an affiliate. Again, lead 10 at checkout will get you 10% and it will help out the channel. So once again, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.